So ADHD is highly heritable, so it gets passed on through families. And that is truly, the, the genetic load of ADHD is very high. And what I tell people is like, you know, this is, there's, there's a concept of genetic permeance, which is like, there is, you know, you can have different severity or you can, and, and as things trickle down, you know, it might get passed on, but it might not be very severe. It might present a little bit differently. But I also tell people, that if it is getting passed on, and if your child does get ADHD, who better to parent that child than you, someone who understands their own brain? This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Okay, so I have to tell you, when I first stumbled upon you on the internet, I fell in love in a way that I haven't fallen in a very long time. (laughs) um, Because I felt like I found somebody who like understood myself and my brain, but also brought like levity to it. So I just want you to know first, like when I found you and I messaged you and I was like, I am obsessed with you. You're like, wait, what? Um, (laughs) It's so true. The obsession is very deep. So let's talk about you. And for anyone who doesn't know you kind of give us a synopsis of who you are on your homepage of your website. You have this quote listed by Thomas R. Insel that I would love for you to elaborate on because when I read it, it really resonated with me. So I, um, I was diagnosed in fourth grade, um, with ADHD after I, like I legitimately started a riot in my classroom. Like I got all, it was a, a day where there was a substitute teacher and now like having kids, I'm horrified. Right. Because I'm like, Oh God, every, like their job is hard enough. Yeah. So I, you know, riot ensues, um, substitute teacher, regular teacher, like you gotta do something. So my mom is a pediatrician. Luckily, luckily for me, like my symptoms were loud enough and prominent enough to go in and get evaluated. I got evaluated. I was medicated shortly after the thing is, this is like a million years ago, right? There was so much stigma around it. So my parents didn't really know how to broach it with me. And so it was, um, you know, they were giving me a medication and they were like, it's going to help with school. It's going to help you focus. It's going to help you participate, all of which were true, but I didn't really know that I had the diagnosis of ADHD. So did pretty well, got into medical school right out of high school. Um, and so I entered medical school, thought I was going to do, um, peds and I wanted to specialize in peds neurosurgery, which now I'm like, what? I think it, I think it just sounded cool in my brain. Yeah. Um, and then I um, went through and as I was going through, like I stopped taking my vitamin uh, that was helping my brain. All, the wheels fell off. I was almost kicked out of school. Like I, I didn't understand what had happened because I'd gone from being pretty high, high, like achieving in high school yeah. to being literally the lowest in my class. So I, I was very confused at this thing. And so that's when I, that's when my parents were like, okay, it's ADHD. Let's figure out what, what your brain is doing. And then from there, my like priorities pretty much shifted in, in terms of like what my interests were. And like, I I knew that in order to maintain sustainability and to keep going forward, that it was a, just really important to understand my brain. And that's kind of what led me into psychiatry and continuing to do this moving forward. Um, okay. So basically the, the thing about the quote is that I, I, when I was starting my journey in terms of clinical practice, and I knew I was starting off this, like, I I was, I'd gained the privilege of other people trusting me enough to take care of them. I thought about like, what is the, what's something that's going to be so important to me moving forward in terms of how I treat other human beings. And I think that basis is humility, like understanding that you're coming to me in a vulnerable position that you want, you need to trust your provider, to help guide you through this journey. And so the provider needs to constantly remind themselves that this is an exercise in humility, that we need to be grateful for this opportunity, that we can help people with our education base and with our clinical expertise and with our lived experience. And so I I put that on my page because I was like, you know, I think this is really important. I think, and the other part of the quote was talking about how a lot of psychiatry is based in just this deep, deep understanding of the brain and there's yeah. so much about the brain, and this is how it ties into the humility part, because there's so much about the brain that we still don't understand. So I think that those two things, being basing my practice in humility and then basing my practice and, and everything that I kind of do stems from how does the brain work and then moving from yeah. there. Yeah, I love that. 
One uh, post that I saw that you recently did that really resonated with me was um, some actor was studying for a role and one of the cast members had ADHD and in studying for it, he realized he had it. And that happened to me. I had an incredible guest on my podcast, Tracy Otsuka, who talks about ADHD and I did the entire interview and then we got off of the interview and she goes, you know why I wanted to come on your show, right? And I was like, no. And she's like, I am very certain that you have ADHD. And I had been interviewing her through this lens of like, let's just help other people. Yeah. And it sent me down the rabbit hole of starting to understand and learn more. And that was how I discovered that I have ADHD and then got diagnosed. So what has it been like for you? Because I mean, you, it's so rare now that I know so much more about it and it's still the top of this iceberg of it. It's so rare that you were diagnosed as a young female. Mm -hmm. Um, But one thing that I'd love for you to talk about is just so many women listening to this might actually have ADHD and never knew it or um, were never diagnosed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So there's, there's a huge, I I call it this huge hidden population, right? That people are running around with undiagnosed ADHD and it's especially prevalent in women because of uh, numerous different reasons. One of them is that women present really differently than males. So typically they're the inattentive daydreaming kind of kid. That kid's not causing problems in school. That kid's minding their own business and kind of spacing out and just like it it, it gets passed from grade to grade. And usually what they hear is she's a pleasure to have in class. Well, she's a pleasure to have in class because she's not like in anyone's face. She's not screaming. She's not like for me, I think I got diagnosed early because I was so annoying. (laughs) I was annoying. I was just like, I was in everyone's face. I could not stay in my seat for the, like the biggest complaint my teachers had about me is like, we never know where she is. Like, I don't know where she is. Like she will be like there. So at one point my sister was in kindergarten and I was in fourth grade and I knew she was in kindergarten. So like in the middle of class, I would like go into like out of my classroom and I would go and try to find her. And they'd be like, where the hell were you? And I'm like, I don't know. So just like I presented very differently where I was taking a lot of the teacher's resources to even just keep track of me. Yeah. So they uh, typically, I, I presented like a male, typically females yeah. don't present like that. Yep. Um, the second thing is that typically females, it, you know, if, if people are lucky or like if they're starting to show symptoms, it yeah. typically doesn't worsen or become super problematic until puberty or until there's some variation, hormonal variation that's happening as well. Because, you know, with ADHD, it is highly variable with your hormonal cycle as well. Would that be impacted by motherhood, pregnancy? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, 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 Okay. yes. So there's this hormonal fluctuation. But the problem is, is that a girl coming in, hormonal fluctuation, I have low frustration tolerance. I can't focus. I'm irritable. I'm what are providers immediately going to think you're hormonal it's puberty it's not a big mm-hmm. deal you're you, this is your age you're a teenager so it's get passed off as hormones which is infuriating but that's what happens yeah and then another reason that it just is you know for a long time with generations my generation generations before me and even some generations after me is it just wasn't talked about Like people thought about, like, even when I was in medical school and I was like, there's no, you know, my dad told me, he's like, okay, well, the reason you're taking that medication is because it's, you have ADHD. And I was like, there is no way, there's no way I'm not a boy. I'm not like running around and, and even by like med school, I kind of calmed down. Mm. I mean, theoretically, I had calmed down by that. The wheels had come off. But like, yeah. I was thinking about the past 10 years before where I had been on medication. And I was like, I'm not hyper. I'm not like, what yeah. is that? So there was just like this very skewed picture of what it looks like. Um, and and it was really stigmatized. So I, I think that there's lots of different reasons. Um, oh, and another reason is that you're frequently misdiagnosed. Like uh, it, yeah. if you're not being passed on, passed off and you're like, it's hormones, a lot of times, especially with young moms or yeah. things like that, they're like, it's motherhood. This is what being a first time mom is like, or it's, um, you know, that you're having some anxiety, you're having some depression. And really when you d- deep dive into it, it's no, I mean, yeah, maybe I, maybe I'm expressing this depression and anxiety, but it's stemming from ADHD. 
Yes. I had so many interesting experiences. So when I had that interview with Tracy and then I sent it to my family, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> everyone needs to listen to this. And my dad was like, oh, I totally have it. And I was like, no one ever told us this. And my mom was like, hundred percent dad absolutely had it. And then it opened up this huge conversation within my family yeah. where my mom was like, the more I learn about it, the more I think all three of you kids have different, you know, spectrums of it. And it was so interesting yeah. for me because I was, I was always a high achiever, high performer, good GPA and stuff, but I had to work so hard at it where mm -hmm. some people, it just comes naturally. I didn't trust myself to remember anything. I would panic before tests. Cause I'd be like, I studied all night and I can't remember anything. I would like just blank out. And so it's so interesting to like, look back. And I think a lot of moms are getting diagnosed because they're looking for solutions for their children, right? Sure. Like they're learning about their kids. So can you talk about like the genetic impacts of that or like how that works? Mm -hmm. So ADHD is, it, well, I'll tell you, it's highly heritable. So it gets passed on through families. And that is truly the, the genetic load of ADHD is very high. And that's why you see it when, you know, when moms are getting their kids evaluated, they're like, oh, that's me. And things like that. You're getting this you pass on through. And it, it doesn't look, it doesn't always look the same, which is tricky, you know, like yeah. how it, it can present in a girl sibling versus a boy sibling can be totally different. It's very multifaceted. It can be dependent on other things, but that's why it's kind of important to understand, okay, there is a heritable link here. Now, typically when I talk about this, there's this like secondary wave of emotion around it because people are like, oh my God, I don't want to have kids mm -hmm. if I'm going to pass this on or I'm yeah. going to do that. And what I tell people is like, you know, this is, there's, there's a concept of genetic permeance, which is like, there is, you know, you can have different severity or you can, and, and as things trickle down, you know, it might get passed on, but it might not be very severe. It might present a little bit differently. But I also tell people that if it is getting passed on, and if your child does get ADHD, who better to parent that child than you, someone who understands yeah. their own brain. And yeah. so that, um, I think that's just an important thing to conceptualize and to understand in terms of part of the joy about being an ADHD specialist and like dealing with this so much in my own uh, practice is that it is so responsive to management. And I'm not even talking about medication. I'm talking yeah. about just treatment in general and looking it in its face and deciding that you want to start going through those symptoms and understanding your brain. That's, it, it just responds well. So yes. that, I mean, I'm, uh, that, that makes it really rewarding to treat and start um, working with patients. I love that. I feel like even just my understanding of myself has expanded with a lot more compassion. Like totally. even through the content that you create and stuff, I can't even tell you how many of your reels I've like forwarded to Drew and be like, this is why I am the way I am. But it's interesting because a lot of times, and I would love to talk about this with you, is that like, it's not, it doesn't have to be like a diagnosis that holds you back. It can be something that can like power you forward and you can be empowered in. And I know for me, now that I have that, I can understand some of the things that I really don't like about myself or I get frustrated by, but I also can see how some of these behaviors, like getting really obsessed and immersed in something or something like that has really propelled me to success. Like I actually think, and maybe you know way more, well, you do know way more about this, but I think a lot of entrepreneurs probably have some level of ADHD. Can we talk about this? I think you're a hundred percent right. And I think that that's because like, if you're thinking about ADHD right at its, like, what is ADHD? ADHD yeah. at its base is a dysregulation issue. So certain parts of your brain are moving faster than other parts. Certain parts of your brain are moving slower than other parts. Norepinephrine and dopamine are being utilized differently in different areas of the brain. But at its base, your brain's moving really fast, right? Yeah. And so you're processing tremendous amounts of data. Now, the, because you're moving so fast and you're processing all of this stuff all at once, you tend to, and this isn't, this doesn't have a judgment component to it, but you tend to take shortcuts. And so one of those things is that you, you can sort through a lot of information and you can either jump to conclusions or you tend to be a little bit... 
impulsive in your decision making, or you tend to not weigh and agonize over risks. You're like, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care if this is a small hiccup. Let's keep doing it. And so those people that have ADHD and their brain is moving faster, they're willing to take those risks. Those are people that can also get a great amount of reward from that, which is awesome. Yeah. Walk me through. So you just touched on certain things. I want, if somebody is listening to this and all of a sudden they're like, wait, do I have it? Or what Mm -hmm. is this? Can you just give us some of the key indicators that might maybe put a little red light on your radar of like, oh, this might be someone. So, so ADHD is broken into three subtypes. There's inattentive, there's hyperactive, and there's combined type, which is a combination of the two. Inattentive is the stuff that you are it's exactly what it sounds like. It difficulty um, organizing information, difficulty with like, I can't keep track of anything and I'm losing stuff. Difficult. <laughs> yeah. Difficulty with um, starting complicated tasks, difficulty with um, maintaining attention or starting tasks and finishing tasks. Um, so executive function kind of things. That's all inattentive stuff. Hyperactive is like, physical uh, hyperactivity, verbal impulsivity. So like, can't stay in your seat. You're fidgeting a bunch. You're you're blurting out answers. You're interrupting people. People are always like, can you let me finish? Can I talk? And then combined type is kind of a combination of the two. And so what I tell people is that a lot of people, like if you did a cross-section of humanity, and this is why, you know, you hear so often, Everybody has ADHD. I do that too. Like, you know, you just hear that all the time. And it's so um, reductive to the people actually who are struggling because they're like, uh, the hell you do. Like, (laughs) you don't know. You know what this is like? Yeah. No. And so people in remote periods of their lives or in periods of high stress, they have difficulty with executive function. They have difficulty processing stuff. They have difficulty with I'm forgetful and I have a short attention span but it's not persistent and chronic Mm -hmm. and limiting because in and of itself, I know there's a lot of controversy about attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder. People get really hung up on that word disorder. Um, And I think there's a lot of um, value in that word. And I think that there's value in that word in that it, it indicates that this is limiting to people's lives. You know, because if it wasn't limiting to someone's life, then why are we talking about it, right? Yeah. yeah. Why why is this a big deal? The fact that it is so persistent, so chronic, and that it bleeds into every facet of your life, that's what makes it a disorder. So for people that are saying, you know, I don't have difficult, or, you know, when you have these absolutely neurotypical people that are telling you, like, just make a list. You're like, oh, of course. I've never thought about that. Like, (laughs) get out of here. So it's, it's, it just, it's one of those things that, um, if you have, there's a chance that you might have exhibited symptoms at one period of your life or something, but that's why it's really nice to be able to rely on a trained clinical eye to put together all those pieces and figure out like, is this actually what we're dealing with? Because if you are, are dealing with something that is, um, you know, say it's anxiety and not actually ADHD and you start treating the ADHD, there's a potential that your anxiety could get worse. So it's, it's important to figure out what it is. If you're going down that medication route, if you're not going down the medication route, honestly, I think a lot of the behavioral techniques could help a lot of people, even if they're in that like tiny portion of their lives that looks like ADHD, using those behavioral strategies could pull you out. Let's talk about some of those strategies that are helpful. Walk us through, because no matter who is listening to this, they are like high achieving, busy, slightly overwhelmed, you know, so let's walk. Are you talking about anybody? (laughs) No, not not us. (laughs) Um, Okay. So let me tell you my journey with behavioral management, because I think that's important. So when I... So I, I go through medical school struggling with that. And for a while I was like, I absolutely don't have ADHD and I rebelled against it. And I was like, I'm not taking any medication. There's no way. So I, I started to dig deeper into that hole. And that's when, you know, my parents took time out and actually started to explain things and gave me the space to do it without the pressure of school. Yeah. And so I actually immersed myself and I was like, okay, I think I do need medication. I think I do need management. So that started my journey. 
was on medication. And then, you know, I got done with medical school and I got into psychiatry residency where I was literally surrounded by psychiatrists and therapists. And it was great. Um, and in that time I moved to Phoenix from Kansas city and I stopped being able to tolerate the medication. I, I like, I couldn't do it. Like I passed out. I like, I lost a bunch of weight. I would get headaches. I'd be jittery. I'd be anxious. And I was like, I, I really don't understand what's happening. Yeah. And it's just, you know, part of it is like my brain ha had been changing. Part of it is I was using behavioral techniques. I didn't necessarily need as much. So then I knew that I wanted to start to move off of it. And I tried a couple of other things, same exact response. So I, I tried to wean myself off of it. Went terribly, <laughs> terribly. <laughs> like wheels came off again when I should have been like at my most stable, but like what I noticed this time is it wasn't as much of the academic stuff, but it was my interpersonal yeah. stuff. Like I was yeah. fighting with my parents. I was fighting with my husband. I was fighting with like, it, it, they, I just could not keep a level ground at any point. I felt like everything was shifting around me. So then I got back on medications, but I really focused on the behavioral stuff. Cause I was like, yeah. eventually I want to try and so I was surrounded by this team of psychiatric and psychological professionals. And they, they literally were like, this is how you eat. This is how yeah. you sleep. This is yeah. how you do, how you show up. This is how you play. Life school. Thank I, you. Seriously. It was life school. It was just like how to be a human. And yeah. so I, from that, then when I got out of residency, I, um, was like, you know what? I, I'm done with like the academic stuff. I'm in practice. It's really fulfilling and enriching in my life. I don't think I need this. I knew I wanted to uh, have children and start that process. And I was like, you know, ideally, and again, by the way, uh, this is not a pro or against meds because like yeah. I have needed it at many portions of my life. And even like I w if I need it again in the future, I will absolutely go to medications. But I, at that point in my life where I was trying for pregnancy and I felt like, you know, I want to see, like, this is my opportunity to potentially be off of medication. I want to see if I could do it. And so since trying for my first, pre so I've been off of medication for about seven years. Yeah. Um, But it's only because I cemented those behavioral techniques. So I feel very, very strongly about good behavioral management. And that comes from just like we talked about before, behave, but understanding your brain, like yeah. just deep diving, understanding this is what my brain is doing. So this is how I course correct. Yeah. So what are some things that you do when you start to feel overwhelmed or yeah. paralyzed or like aloof or yeah. anything? Do you have anything that you can share? Yeah. So sometimes, and again, this is stemming from like what, what, are the circumstances around that. So when I first yeah. started going through this process where I was trying to gather information about like, what are my patterns? Like what, yeah. what happens to me? I didn't really have a good tracking mechanism. And so I, I kept a note on the notes app on my phone. Yes. I would idea. just document that kind of stuff. And I would do like, this is sleep. This is my food intake. This is my water intake. And actually part, well, I'll get into that, but like part of that, of the app I'm creating for ADHD management focus genie, it has that built in because I was like, this is what I was doing every single day for three yeah. years to figure out what my patterns were. But it, it's, and, and if you don't use that app, just having it on your phone and being able to kind of say like, okay, this is what, this is how I was trending. So there, it helped me kind of understand, like I'm overwhelmed I'm literally hungry. <laughs> like but if yes, I eat, yes. it will be better. Or it's yes. overwhelmed because I haven't had a sip of water all weekend. Or I'm overwhelmed because I have been sleeping so poorly that mm -hmm. I do not feel awake for the first six hours of the day. And then I've missed even more. And so it's, but like I, the problem with ADHD is that you don't readily recognize your patterns. I think what people do is like every day you're reinventing the wheel. You recognize yeah. the problem. Yeah. But you try to course correct without manipulating like an organ. It's sleep training where you're like, oh, they slept through the night. Let's do this every single day. And then it's like the next night it's a new thing. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, it's exactly like that. It's it's just, it's really, it, it's so multifaceted and there's so many different variables that go into it. So it's really, really important to figure out your patterns. So that, that would be my number one advice for anything. It's find a way to, in an organized fashion, track your variables. Um, and like with the app, the thing that I like about it is like back in the day when I was doing it with my, one of my attendings is the one who, who told me to do that. Yeah, and he made me like plug it into Excel, um, and so I had to go back Open and like up. type all these things. And then he's like, "Let's see a chart." So I generate a chart, and so like with this app, what I'm doing is like you open up the app and you plug in all of those things, and then over time you see what you're doing. And so then if you're like, "Oh my god, I had this huge fight with my husband on Monday," you go back to Monday and you're like, oh, "Okay, I didn't eat. Oh, okay, didn't right. sleep. Oh, okay." And it's, so it's easier to kind of figure out where where's a hole. Um, so I have a question about this. So yeah. one thing I love about tracking, especially for women is tracking also around your cycles. Mm-hmm. So since there are hormonal impacts, mm-hmm. would that make sense? Like if whenever I get PMS or like the week before, I don't usually have a lot of the regular PMS symptoms, mm-hmm. but without fail, every time I'm PMSing, I will say, I can't do it all anymore. Like there is like that moment of like, I'm carrying the weight of the world and I cannot do it anymore. And then I'm like, oh, and my period's coming. Does that impact like the All monthly right. cycle impact your ADHD? Yes. Oh, Je- okay. So Jenna, what happens is that for, like on a very, very basic level, yeah. when your estrogen drops, which is typically what your body is trying to do when you're getting ready to, you know, expel that egg and endometrial lining and all of that stuff. Yeah. When your body is ready to do that, your estrogen level drops. When that happens, estrogen and dopamine kind of hang out together and your dopamine level drops as well. And so in that low dopamine state, you're understimulated, you're overwhelmed. There's like literally not enough gas in the tank. And the thing that's terrible is that if you look at it, half of the month is really you're in a lower estrogen state. So it, when I get into, like, once I started understanding that, I'm not even kidding. I will plan events and stuff yeah. in the periods where I'm like, it's, it's after my period, I'll be fine. And like, yeah. it's, you know, it's, I'm not going to be in that low estrogen, low dopaminergic state. Oh, that's so wild. So I want to know, wait. Can I, this is somewhat personal, so you can totally like sure. switch it, but is your husband neurodivergent or is he? Oh my God. Not? No, no. <laughs> I mean, he Same. is so, so he's an attorney and his brain yeah. works like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even understand how his brain works. Yeah. It, it's like so painfully like rigid Linear. and organized. Yeah. Yes. Very yeah. much to, to the point where like, I'm, t- and you know, it's like, I'm, I'm watching us. 50 years in the future where he's like, I'm telling a story and I'm like all over the map. And yeah. like, I've taken like 50 different tangents and then he'll like, look over the people I'm talking to and he'll summarize my story in like three like words. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> okay. I feel like when I met Drew in college, his room, like he had these like Tupperware containers with like batteries organized. Like if, if I were mm. to ask him, like, do you have a triple A battery? He would like pull out the correct tote, open it up and find it. If somebody asked me for that, I'd be like opening remote controls and like digging in junk drawers of like, I'm sure I have one somewhere. And yeah. that is like so exemplary of our life together sure. where it's like, he is like perfect. Like he knows there's a place for everything. Everything has a place. I am the opposite where I'm like chaos. And I'm like, I know where everything is in this chaos. And when you clean it, I don't know where it went. Oh my and God. So it's I like, know. Oh, so funny. So do you have any tips for like people that have different brain types in relationships <laughs> asking for a friend? Uh, <laughs> um, I will tell you that one of the things that has helped me the most is like understanding that our brains were different because like yeah. we went yes. from like we dated for a little bit and then I mean like not enough time to really know each other or spend a significant amount and then it became long distance because I was in residency and in that time like when we actually got engaged and lived in the same place I was just like 
what is what is this? Like, I can't share my space with you. You suck. And so that like, I, it was so difficult for me to kind of figure out because a lot of our fights would stem around this, like my inability to, uh, to be up to his standards of organization. And I was like, Dang. what a crazy thing to be upset about. Cause like this mess, I do not even clock it. I'm walking past yeah. it and it does not yes. even go on my radar. Yes. So I feel like that was an underlying issue, but the bigger problem is we didn't know how to talk to each other about it. Yep. So he was like, why am I constantly telling you the same thing over and over again? You're not a child. And I'm like, why am I taking the brunt of this? Because it's not a big deal. And I also don't care. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I like so hard though. Like, cause it's like, it doesn't bother me. So like, I don't care. But then I've had to like, even, even when we were prepping for this interview, I like made a coffee, I had a spoon and I put it in the sink. And then I like thought about it and I was like, it matters to him that I wash this spoon. Doesn't matter to me, but I'm going to wash this spoon. Good but like, you. I've had to like train myself of like, this matters to them and I need it to at least subconsciously slightly matter to me. But isn't that so hard? It's so hard. It's so hard. So our fights, start, like we had this biblical blowout and part of our what that stemmed from is because I will take off fruit stickers like, and I'll just put them wherever, like they'll yep. be on the counter. They'll be like on the toilet paper roll and not toilet paper roll. They'll be on like the paper towel roll. They'll be on the fridge. They'll be like on another fruit. And he's like, just put it in the trash. And I was like, yeah. it's sticky. Like, I don't know why that doesn't like, that doesn't bother me. Like that's not yeah. that weird. Um, and so that's what, and he's like, it's not about the fruit stickers. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> but it is. Okay. So when we, so we finally got to a spot where we were communicating at each other, but not with each other. We were just like yeah. talking around each other. And so he, he, it was actually his idea. He's like, let's write things down. So he wrote something and he like articulated what the issue was. I wrote something. I articulated like what this was. And then we both read each other the letters. It wasn't in response. We just wrote yes. like what, where we came from. And we both could hear it for the first time and look at things and like without trying to formulate our responses. Yes. And when I understood like this causes him anxiety when, when I'm disorganized, it makes him feel destabilized. That gave me the motivation to be like, I need to be more mindful of this. And in that case, I had that extra, cause I will never have the internal motivation. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I don't same. care. Same. So yeah, so exactly. It's important to him. So then you you start to adjust accordingly. And what I've found is that in things like that, small things, like you can start doing like little hacks to make that a little bit easier. Like for me, like another thing, it's like with our Keurig, I'll yeah. always leave that gross pod yeah. in the thing or like, you know. What it, aliens took it out? Right. <laughs> Apparently that's like a big thing. Um, if I like, I don't know, I've never replaced, I, I don't, I don't unload the, I, and I leave, I leave dishes on the side of the sink. I don't even put them in the sink yeah. instead yeah. of the dishwasher. And yeah. that drives him literally bonkers. And I'm like, well, yeah. it's you, it's like such sorry. a process too. I feel like that's why though, I appreciate the work you do and like the humor that's brought to it as well. Cause even today drew is like leaving for school drop off. He's like, where's the key to my car? I'm like, I don't know. I had it yesterday. I don't, he's like, every time you drive, I don't know where the key is. And like, and I was like, I don't know. I, I brought it in with me to the orthodontist. Oh, here it is. It's in my wallet. Like, but if I, I mean, it's interesting to see those differences, but like for me, one of the big ones is I get so stressed out by like mail by mm. like shipping things Ignore like it. I could never <laughs> return a single thing right so I'll like order stuff online I'll be like oh if I don't if it doesn't fit I'll return it I no mm -mm. I can't those tasks like very much overwhelm me and so like I've had to like explain to him like I just need you to run to the UPS store for me today like it would help me so much because it's stressing me out to see that package and knowing that like I can't follow through on that right now and so it's just so it's interesting but I also cannot imagine being married to someone like me like if two neurodivergent brains were together. I feel like I would feel like a teenager, like an unsupervised teenager in an adult <laughs> life. That's what I feel like I'd be like. There's pros and cons. I mean, there's some totally. people that are like in, like they're two neurodivergent people in the couple and it works really well because they both have yeah. this place of understanding. They're working on coping skills together. I can tell you for myself, 
I need that because he provides that stability for me so that I can, you know, if I am a little bit more disorganized or something like that. And I felt like, and maybe unconsciously, I mean, it was unconscious, but like, I felt like when we first got together and like, I actually was like conceptualizing, like, what would it look like if we had kids or like something like that? I remember telling my mom, I was like, you know, I really think that having kids is going to be difficult unless I have a a partner that's able to like kind of keep it together better than I can. Cause I think it'll be really difficult to take care of a small person. I I'm going to get overwhelmed and I don't, I I want someone who is going to be able to stand on their feet and calm me down in that moment. So I don't necessarily know if that's a neurodivergent thing or anything. It's just like the complimentary part of, you, I guess. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't need that. There's some people that don't even need that and they can do all of these things on their own. I know that I, I need, and I really wanted that kind of companionship to help me raise a family. I feel like even if I travel without him, I am like a frat boy in a hotel room. Like I like, and then if I'm with him, he like takes everything out of his suitcase, puts it into the drawers. And like, I'm like, oh, is this what we do as adults? I cannot even imagine that. No, it's just like a rummage fest every time. Yes. I don't even like suitcases. Like when we get home from a vacation, he unpacks like right away. And I'm like two months later, still digging out of the same suitcase. Eventually all of that stuff will get you know what? You and I can go travel together and have okay, a great. Fest. It'll we be will great. be a mess, but yeah. I am ready for it. One thing that I would love to share is if somebody's listening to this and they're like, Ooh, um, maybe I have this, or maybe someone I love has this, or maybe I just want to learn more about it. Like, what would you say would be some good steps to take? Um, I think that there is, so to be totally honest with you, Part of why I got onto social media in the first place is because I got really interested in talking about ADHD and explaining ADHD and doing those things. But I found there was a big hole because like when I wanted to like show patients and talk about ADHD, I didn't like the books that were out there because I'm like, they're not written for my brain and I don't want to read this. I don't want to read this. So either they were super, super clinical and I was like, I don't even get this. What are you talking about? I'm just so boring. Or it's like so unclinical that I'm like, this isn't giving me, this isn't giving me ADHD specific information. I want something that's written about our brains and things like that. And so I've had a hard time, honestly, finding information that I feel is like now I know there's a lot more stuff out there, but, but I, I was in that spot in that journey where I was like, I don't, I don't know where to get good info. But I think part of it boils down to like also knowing what kind of information you're going to absorb best. So if there are people that are like, I'm never going to read, then don't read. Find your information some other way. Go on YouTube. Try to find like a good sound educational bite video. Go on podcasts are great. This is such, it's such important work that you do and like other podcasters do in terms of like, expanding um reach for yeah. you know talking about ADHD and also destigmatizing at the same time that's really important i think that there's some people i i i talk about social media a lot um cuz it can be a useful tool the oh, yeah. the reason i don't love social media um well i mean I, there are a lot of reasons but like <laughs> the reason i i i started on this journey to create an app in the first place is because I really like the information on social media. There's a lot of good information. It's also a lot of bad information. And even the good information isn't really organized in a great way. So like if I want to learn about rejection sensitivity, I'm at the whim of the algorithm. Like they're going to show me whatever they think is about rejection sensitivity. Some of it could be true. Some of it could not be like you, you're not really knowing what you get. So I think it's, there is a there's a hole in terms of ADHD. Well, I think you filled this hole <laughs> in so many ways. So for everyone listening, they're like, where can I find you? Let me tell you, you are one of my favorite people to follow. Oh. I have not, like I forward every post you do to somebody because it makes <laughs> me think of somebody. So this is now the time. Where can everybody find you and connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I am on social media. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on YouTube. Um, the Psych Doctor MD. 
Uh, you can also find me through Focus Genie, which is the app we just released, um, which is a comprehensive ADHD management behavioral ADHD management platform. So it has educational modules where you can pick and choose and you can learn about every different little bit of them. And they're fun categories, Jenna. It's like stuff like that I felt were very salient in my own life, like how to recognize a toxic relationship, how to cope with a late diagnosis, how to like stuff that is actually instead of just like the run of the mill stuff, including stuff like fundamentals of diagnosis and all this other stuff, how to get diagnosed, all that. Um, there is also that tracker that we talked about where you can literally look at over time. How did I drink? How did I eat? What is my mood? Like what, like how much am I fidgeting? Um, yeah. it, it has a mindfulness component. And then the, the thing that I use the most, and I've been using it for like six or seven months now, as it's, it's been in production, is literally a productivity like tool where you can, yeah. Um, there's a to-do list and I'm too lazy to type stuff. You can just voice record into this to-do list. Yeah. You, you can complete them. And then it shows you insights of how much of your to-do list you're completing per day. And over time, there's a task tracker where you can set it and you can either listen to music or you can body double. There can be someone doing the task with you. It's just, Ooh. it's cool. I love that. I'm so yeah. excited to be I'm a so user excited. because <laughs> I just feel like too, there's been a gap in like being diagnosed, doing my own research, yeah. but there hasn't been a lot of tools. And so I'm so excited Yay! about this. I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, we are hilarious friends, but we'll like text each other. And then like five days later, we'll respond. I'm and so then we're sorry. like, don't apologize. No, I was like, don't apologize. This is how we are. So I love, I love our friendship. I can't wait to watch it grow. Thank you for coming on the oh, podcast. Of course. Thank you for having me. But we need to remember it's about quality. If the quantity of what we chase does not give more quality to our lives, then we're using the wrong calculator. So when we're sitting there going, where do I go? I think we first have to say, one, admit the lies we tell, the lies we believe for convenience, the, the, the BS we've been letting ride for ourselves to get by. Just admit it. I'm not judging you. Don't judge yourself. We all do it. 